Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, it says this, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. The title for my sermon tonight is Strange Fire, uh, but I also thought about It's Lit and, uh, and D-Y-O-B, or no, D-Y, D-V-Y, me and Matt went over it before, D, I'm struggling now that I'm up here, but D-V-Y-O-F, don't bring your own fire, but I went with Strange Fire. Somebody say Strange Fire. Amen. I'm just going to pray quickly before we actually get started, and then we'll get on with it. Jesus, thank you for bringing us to your house tonight. Thank you for your spirit and your presence that's in this room. Thank you for your anointing that's on this platform, for anointing the ministers, Lord Jesus, and, and, and the people that have come to do music and sing to you, Lord Jesus, and sing praises. And God, for setting up the atmosphere for your spirit to work. God, I pray that you would anoint me. I pray that you would anoint what I'm about to say and that it would all come from you. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Fire is one of the first forms of energy that humans learned to control. It provides a source of warmth and of cooking food and of protection from predators. And for my dad, fire provided what he thought would be a useful tool in burning the brush in the backfield of the church. Uh, he's told this story before, so I'm not going to belabor it. But there was a time when he was trying to clean up some two-by-fours from some demolition and ended up nearly clearing out the back 40 acres along with those two-by-fours. So he really solidified in my mind the message not to play with fire. Um, but apparently God doesn't want us to play with fire either. Now, my opening text was in Leviticus, and Leviticus is just one of those books in the Bible that you kind of forget about. You know, like if you ask somebody what their favorite book of the Bible is or where their favorite verse comes from, you're never going to hear somebody say Leviticus. Like, well, if you turn to Leviticus, no, like Leviticus is a book that is long and descriptive and to be totally truthful, uh, kind of hard to read. So I read through one of those Bible reading plans where you can read through the whole Bible in a year and I stayed on track almost the whole time. Can anybody guess where I might have slowed down? If your answer is Leviticus, you're on the right track. Um... It seemed like Leviticus took me forever to read, but I also learned from that there's, there's still some important lessons that we could take from it, and that's part of what I want to talk about tonight. So Leviticus takes place right after the Israelites are freed from their slavery in Egypt, and God takes them into the desert, and he brings them to the foot of Mount Sinai. And one of the things that God teaches the Israelites is how to create a space in their lives to worship him, and he gives them principles to learn, and he gives them a place to practice these principles, and he calls that place the tabernacle. So to help the Israelites, God decides that Israel needs to have priests, and priests or the priesthood are going to totally devote their lives to God, and they're going to work in the tabernacle, make sure that everything's running smoothly over here, and make sure that all the sacrifices are being done correctly over here. So God chooses a family from the tribe of Levi that is going to be the priesthood, and he chooses the family of Aaron. Now, we're going to stop here for a second and take a really quick detour, because here's what we know about Aaron. We know that he went with Moses to speak with Pharaoh, and then after the Exodus, we know that when Moses went up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, he needed somebody to kind of run things while he was gone and babysit the Israelites, you know? So Moses gets Aaron to watch over the Israelites and make sure that everyone's getting enough manna and that the teenagers are camel tipping in the middle of the night, and so he picks Aaron to help him do this. But here's what happens next. Exodus 32 verses 1 through 4 says this, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. And we don't know like if he's coming back, he's been up there for so long. And so Aaron answers them and he says this, this is his idea. Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people take off their earrings and they bring them to Aaron. And so he says this, and he t it, t it says that he took what they handed him and they made it into an idol in the shape of a calf and he fashioned it with a tool. And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And so we already went over it. Aaron wasn't playing dumb. Like he knew exactly what was going on. Um, he was with Moses from the get-go, like we already mentioned. 
uh, when him and Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, Aaron was there with him the whole time. Aaron knows that God is the one who delivered the Israelites. Yet Aaron is the one who not only leads Israel to commit the sin of worshiping this false idol of the golden calf, but Aaron flat out denies what God has just done in freeing them from slavery and gives all of the credit to these idols that he makes. So picture God right after this happens. He sees that one of the men that he's trusted to help lead Egypt out of slavery has turned around and taken a step in the total other direction into idol worship. But here's how forgiving and gracious God is. Here's how he reacts to this scenario. In spite of the huge mistake that Aaron makes, God still chooses Aaron's family to be lead as priests, and they're the ones who are going to lead Israel into the presence of God and into uh, the relationship that he invites them to join him in in the wilderness. Um, the encouragement here that I took from it is this. Aaron was never qualified. Uh, he didn't do anything to get God to make him priest uh, or to qualify him for being priest. But even still, God's vision for Aaron and his purpose for Aaron was so much greater than Aaron's mistakes and his past and his faults that God saw Aaron's potential and God looked at him and he said, that is who I want to intercede for Israel. That's who's going to lead them into my presence. Is anybody grateful that God still has a plan for you like he had for Aaron? Is anybody grateful that even though you might have messed up, that no matter how bad your mistake was or how unworthy you think you might be, God still has a vision for you, God still has a promise for you, and he still has a purpose that he wants to use you to fulfill. Just praise God for your purpose, just for a second. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. So God designates Aaron's family to be the priesthood. And, and Aaron and his four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, get ordained as priests. And this is a big deal. Uh, Leviticus 8 details it for us, and I'm not going to read it, so they're not going to have it on the screens, but it says that they're dressed in fresh robes and sashes, and the blood from their ordination offering was brushed onto their ears, their thumbs, and their toes. And they were still amazed and in awe because they had just witnessed a fire that literally came out from before God and consumed the burnt offering. Um, beforehand so to put this into perspective like and it's not a perfect comparison but imagine how amazed you would be if you make dinner one night and your family gets around for dinner and you pray over it and you bless it and then all of a sudden God makes the pot roast he swoops in he makes the pot roast you had planned for dinner burst into flames and consumes it you might get excited because now you have an excuse to get pizza or skip the dishes praise the Lord but the point is this <laughs> God marks these priests, and he makes it clear that the purpose of the priesthood is something that is sacred, and it's something that's important. Uh, and he marks it with a fire when he consumes that sacrifice. So one of the greatest responsibilities and privileges of being a priest when they would go into the tabernacle to offer up sacrifices and prayers to God and intercede on behalf of the people, uh, the priest would carry in a censer that they took from the altar of incense. And because the altar of incense was used for burning incense, the censer would carry a fire and put off a smoke that it says was a sweet smell that pleased the Lord. So here's where we get into trouble. Somebody say, here's the problem. Nadab and Abihu, on their first assignment as priests of Israel, they decide to go into the tabernacle without getting fire from the brazen altar. So this step in the process was so crucial because Leviticus mentions several times that the fire in the altar was to burn continuously. God wanted a perpetual fire there, and he must have had a reason for it. Before the giving of the law, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush that wasn't consumed in Exodus 3. God chose the appearance of a continuous fire when calling Moses to lead the people of Egypt out into a new land. And then later when God was leading the Israelites out of Egypt, he appeared as a pillar of fire at night in Exodus 13. Then came the law. Outside the tabernacle, the fire for the burnt offering was commanded to be kept burning. Never was it to be extinguished. And Leviticus 6 verse 13 instructs, the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. This is mentioned three times in this chapter in verses 9, 12, and 13. Um, and, and that one reason the, altar, or the, the fire on the altar was so important was that it was started directly by God. In Leviticus 9.24, it says that there came out a fire from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which, was, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. So the fire on the altar served as a constant reminder of God's power. It was a gift from heaven, and no other source of fire was acceptable to God. He makes that very clear. This fire also represented God's presence. In Deuteronomy 4.24, it says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. No wonder God had a problem when they decided to make their own fire 
to bring before God. When Nadab and Abihu brought their own fire, God rejects it and he calls it strange fire. When Nadab and Abihu bring their humanity into God's holiness, not only does God reject their strange fire, but he rejects the ones who bring the fire and Nadab and Abihu fall dead there in the presence of God. Now, this might seem pretty cruel or maybe unnecessary that God would have to kill these two people for what they did, but God was setting a standard and, and he was giving us a warning that when he gives direction to follow what he says, um, when we go our own way, it's going to lead us to failure. So when God gives me direction, he doesn't want me to bring my personal opinion, my personal excuses, my personal fragility, my personal philosophy, or my personal preference, because he already showed me that he's not going to receive it. He already called it what it is, and he called it strange fire. My last point that I want to make, I, told, I'm, I'm gonna be, I was going to be quick tonight. <laughs> um, Nadab and Abihu went straight into the presence of God without their father. Um... If they would have gone in with Aaron, their father, and allowed him to walk with them and teach them and guide them, he would have been able to stop them from offering up their strange fire and likely would have been able to prevent their tragic death. But because Nadab and Abihu left the presence of their father um, and continued on like they saw fit, they're the ones who died and they're the ones who suffered. Because Nadab and Abihu left the presence of their father, they never fulfilled the promise and the purpose that God had intended for them to walk in. And I said all of that to say this. um, When we walk away from the Father, when we reject God, when we go our own way and we offer up our fire, our philosophy, and our version of Christianity, we lose out on the potential that God has for us and we lose out on the promise that God wants to fulfill in our lives. Now, I don't want that, and I don't want to lose out on what God has for my life, and I don't want us to miss out uh, on the promise of God for our church and our families and our youth groups because it's not worth it to offer up the strange fire. If you would stand with me, I'm coming super quickly to a close. Um, This isn't just an Old Testament principle. Uh, Galatians 3 verse 1 says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? What God has begun in the church of Acts 2 started in a prayer meeting and it ended with an outpouring And that can't happen if it's in the flesh. We need the same tongues of fire to settle on us today that they had in Acts 2. And this can't be completed by our human effort, our ability, or our ingenuity. It can only happen with the fire of the Holy Ghost. And I want to be a part of that. I want to make sure that whatever we're offering to God is fresh fire, holy fire, and acceptable, acceptable to him. So why don't we just lift our hands and offer God praise tonight and offer him fire that is holy. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you.